If you have your Bible, and if you'll turn to Luke chapter 15, we're going to be looking at a familiar passage, uh, the prodigal son, but I do want to uh, maybe look at it in a different angle than maybe what we have before, maybe just a little bit different perspective of uh, in the context of all these parables happening right after one another. And so uh, there, there, was a, uh, <clears throat> there was a sociologist that was writing a book about the difficulties of growing up in a large family. And, and when I tell you this little quick story, you're going to think, wow, that is a large family. Anymore, we consider four or five children a large family. And so he, this person found a mother of 13 children, found a mother of 13 children. And after asking a, a, a few questions, he asked, do you think all children deserve full, impartial love and attention of a mother? And uh, that, that's a big question to ask somebody that has 13 children, right? And sh she said, of course. And so he followed up with, with, well, which one of your children do you love the most? He was hoping to catch her in a contradiction there. And this is what she answered. She said, the one who is sick until he gets well, the one who is away until he gets home. That mother's response is much like the shepherd who left the 99, right? For the, the woman that looks for the one coin. For the father who threw a party for his wayward son that we're going to read here in just a minute. Um, the, context, the context of the, these parables, there's three right in a row, uh, is this idea that the religious leaders of Jesus' day resented the time that he gave to sinners. He gave so much time and attention to sinners, the religious leaders hated that. They hated that about him. Um, so he told these three stories to emphasize God's love for, for those wandering in sin and, and that God had a plenty of enough love to go around, just like that mother talked about. There's plenty of love, but our father is perfect in his love. No matter how good a mother is, how good an earthly father is, we fail. Uh, we, we have things that just are not perfect, but our Heavenly Father is. And as we prepare to read this parable here in just a second, um, I want us to remember that th this, is, this is the third in a trilogy. All three were told right after one another. Okay, this wasn't Jesus told a story, then he goes and finds new people. This is all right here together. He tells these three stories. And I want us to, to remember the context of these of this trilogy. So I think before we read our actual text, let me read for you verses one and two uh, of the chapter. And if you have your Bible open, which I hope you do, because I don't have really any PowerPoint that's going to go with this. But th this, is, this is what it says in, in verses one and two of chapter 15. It says, now the tax collectors and the sinners were drawing near to him, him being Jesus. And the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. And then it says in verse 3, so then he told the, these parables. And he immediately, after seeing that they're grumbling, that they don't like the way he's spending his time, he, he tells these three parables, all right, the, the shepherd that left the 99 and found the one, the woman that looks for the lost coin, and the prodigal son, which we're about to read. Uh, it, it's crucial for us to keep this context in mind as we study this parable because it provides a key to understanding why Jesus told the parables in the first place and what he wanted to communicate through them. Um, it's, it's also helpful to study the parable in a way that it highlights the structure that Jesus gave it. And, and really what he's wanting to do is he's wanting to compare and contrast the relationship of the father in the story with his two sons. You're going you're gonna to hear about two sons here. The emphasis is usually on the one called the prodigal son, but there's another one there, and we're going to see how God works and how God interacts, how the father interacts with these two. And so if you found your place, stand with me. This is a little bit lengthier. Um, I'm going to be reading out of the ESV tonight. But starting in, in verse 11, it says, There was a man who had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me a share of property that is mine to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all that he had and took a journey into a far country. And there he squandered his property in reckless living. 
And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in the country, and he began, uh, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out uh, to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him into his fields to feed pigs, and he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, or some translation said when he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger. I will rise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and he came to his father, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion, and he ran and he embraced him and he kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and he is found. And they began to celebrate. Now we're introduced to the other son. Now his older son was in the field. And he came and drew near to the house, and he heard music and dancing, and he called one of the servants and asked him what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother has come, and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in, so his father came out and entreated him. But he answered his father, look, these many years I have served you, I've never disobeyed your command, yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends." But when, this, uh, w- but when this son of yours came, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him? And he said to him, son, you were always with me, and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad, for, your brother, uh, for this your brother was dead, and he is alive. He was lost, and he is now found. Father, we come, we pray tonight that you would bring understanding. Father, I I believe full-heartedly that each one of us have something to hear out of this text, something to be reminded of, something to be convicted of, something to be encouraged by. Father, your word do its perfect work tonight, and may your Holy Spirit work as only it can. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I I want us to first look, you may be seated, Uh, I want us to first look at uh, the father's relationship with the younger son, all right? Uh, And and so I I want us to kind of just walk through the story. I know you're very familiar. If if you're anything like me, you grew up, you've heard this preached, heard it taught, you've probably read it yourself quite a few times. But I want us to look at the younger son's rebellion and repentance. And in verses 11 and 12, here's kind of what happens. There's a couple of things here that indicate a rebellious attitude in the younger son. Firstly, the son doesn't ask, uh, doesn't just ask for his father's inheritance, he demands it. Okay, in a Jewish culture, that is a big no-no. I know we live in American culture where it just, it's almost like, well, teens and kids just do whatever, but this is a big no-no. You, th- this is a- at the pinnacle of, of arrogance and pride and disrespect by him demanding you give me the inheritance. The Greek, the Greek form translated uh, is imperative. It's a command, and it's a very, very disrespectful way for him to address his father. A son would never command his father to do anything, all right? Uh, and that's understood culturally, not, not just from a biblical standpoint or a Jewish you know, tradition. This is culturally. You would never do something like this. Second, the very fact that the... the uh, that the fellow demands his inheritance now rather than his, upon his father's death, which is what would normally happen, indicates that not only is he rebellious and disrespectful, uh, but it, it kind of comes out in two different ways. Uh, the first one is this. He communicates that he has no concern for his father's well-being at all. To, to demand you give me the inheritance now means I don't care if anything happens to you. I, I want my inheritance now. He, he wants to take, the lar- uh, t- take a large portion of his estate away for you that don't understand. When a man had two sons and he demanded inheritance, here's what would happen between two, two children, two, two sons, is the older one would get two-thirds of the inheritance and the younger would get a third. So he's asking for his father, you give me a third of everything you own. 
not just asking. Remember, he's demanding it. The, the, the verb he uses here is, you give it to me. I demand that you give this to me. And so uh, he doesn't care about, about his dad's welfare at all. He shows very little concern for the, his dad's future by this. The second thing is, he's pretty much saying this, I'm tired of living under your authority, and I can't wait for you to die. I mean, by asking for inheritance, that's practically what he's telling his father. You're dead to me. You matter nothing to me. I, I'm tired of the authority that you have in, in my life. His lack for concern for his father also reflects his desire to get away as soon as possible. Because when he gets that, what does he do? He runs off into the far country. He gets as far away from his father, which shows that act of rebellion. That, that he didn't want to be around anything that had any type of authority in his life. He, he was going to be his own person. And so that's in verses one, uh, 11 and 12. Verse 13, the Greek word translated prodigal actually means to live in a wild and abandoned manner. Uh, to live in a wild and uh, abandoned manner. And this idea of reckless or uh, riotous or loose living is what it says that he, he goes to do. He goes and he sets out on purpose to take things that weren't his and live recklessly. It, it, it pertains to this reckless behavior. When his older brother later accuses him uh, uh, in front of his father about living with harlots, you can kind of understand, right? It never says that, that he actually did that, but it says that he lived recklessly. And with that idea, that, that, uh, that idea of him being prodigal, him living recklessly, is that's probably what he did. It says that he, he lived loosely. He lived without any authority in his own life. Whatever he felt, he just did. The point, the point is that the young man got away from his family accountability uh, so, uh, so he could just blow his entire inheritance on, on ungodly living. Now, I'm not going to go too far, but we know that people do that all the time, right? We, we understand this aspect of getting away. When people slip into sin... Where's one of the first places uh, that, that they run from? The church. They, they get heavily convicted. There's no, they don't want any accountability. That, that, that's why you know when people begin to slip away, right, that don't want to be here anymore, don't want to be around godly influence, we, we can assume that they're doing some things they shouldn't, all right? We get blamed a lot that that's a bad assumption, but time and time again, that shows us. And you don't even have to do it in the Christian realm. When, when children, teenagers, or or those uh, that are a little bit older and teenagers, young adults, don't want anything to do with their family, typically it has a little bit to do with rebellion or a lot to do with rebellion and having no accountability. They don't want to be held accountable anymore. And so we see this in verses 14 and 16. Notice that the son's foolish and wasteful living had left him no recourse when famine came. When he spent everything and a famine came, what happened to him? Well, verse 15, the beginning of it says that he became a slave to a foreigner, all right? That, that's insulting to some, someone of his, of his stature for him to have to be a slave, right, a servant uh, of a foreigner. What, but it, that wasn't bad enough. He ended up feeding pigs, all right? For a Jewish man, is that an ideal, uh, is that an ideal job? No. No, why? Because they're, they're an unclean animal. You wouldn't, you wouldn't take care of those things. And it's, uh, it was a huge disgrace, and it, it rendered him unclean by taking care of these things this idea that, uh, that, that he was caught up in just junk. I mean, just a mess. Uh, but he, it got even worse because what does it say? Uh, that uh, he ended up being treated so badly that he was willing, even glad to eat some of the food he was feeding the pigs. He got so de destitute that he was willing to eat the slop that he was feeding the pigs. And at the end, end of these verses here, it says that nobody helped him at all. Why? You know why. Where is he? He's in off in a foreign land. Everyone he's ever known. The security he's always had is gone. Was it stripped from him? No. He chose to walk away from it. He chose in rebellion to do his own. And this is where it leads us. Rebellion and sin always leads us to destitution. It leads us to a place we never thought we'd be. I guarantee you when he left the house, did he think this is where he was going to be? No, everybody in their pride would never think they would do this, but this is where he's at, and no one's willing to help him. Verses 17 through 20, though, I'm glad that the story doesn't just end with, and so it was, and we never know what happens, but it says in, in verses 17 through 20 
that, uh, that thankfully uh, there's repentance here. It says in, in verse seven, uh, 17 that he came to himself or he came to his senses. This idea of repentance. And how do we know that he repented? Because eventually he changed direction, didn't he? He didn't just stand, stay in the slop and go, you know, I probably shouldn't have done this and had regret. There's a, there's a point where it says he came to his senses and he begins to think, you know what? I had it better in my father's house, in his presence. And even if I go back, I, I can't be a son. I've already spent, I've already asked for inheritance. I've demanded it. I've, I've cut myself off, but I could at least go be a servant. My servant, my dad and father's servants have it better. And it says that he got up from there and he went out with this idea that I'm going to go back to the father and I'm going to tell him I have done everything wrong. Will you allow me to at least be a, uh, be a servant? And so he, he, he would have gladly been one of his father's slaves, one of his servants. Why? Because he, he considered himself unworthy, which in the reality of it, let's think in Jewish culture, was he unworthy? Absolutely. He disrespected his father. He demanded inheritance before death. He'd gone and spent all that in a foreign country. He'd worked a job that was just nasty and ill repute. I mean, no way would anyone see that this, this young man is worth anything. But that, that's where sin brings us. The law and sin brings us to that point of understanding we need something bigger than what we think we have. And it says that he came to his senses and he turned back, he repented. And aren't you glad that, that, he, that he did that? And what we see here is a shift in to not just what did the young man do, but how did the father respond to this young man, to this younger son who had squandered so much. And we pick that up and we clearly see in this parable that the father reacts in love towards his son. First, we have already seen the father's response to the, other, the younger son's rebellion, right? Now, I, I know maybe you don't understand this because in our, our world, this doesn't always happen. But in the Jewish culture, when, when that younger son came and demanded his father to do that, that father could have done a lot with his son. All right, that father, uh, that father could have said, you know what, you sit, no. I mean, it could, it could have beat him out of rebellion, whatever he wanted to do. But out of this love for his son, he says, okay, sure, here it is. If you want to walk away from this, go ahead. And that, sh that shows love. Now, you might be like, no, that's not love. Uh, in, in reality, it, it, it is love. He just allows it to go. By the way, our father is, is one that's like that as well, right? Does he hold his thumb on us when we decide to be in rebellion? What does he do? If you want to live in rebellion, have at it. Have at it. And he just allows the consequences of our own sin and rebellion to come against us. And so we already see this before the son ever gets to this point. Before the son ever gets to this point, we, we see that. Second, uh, we're, not surprised by the, uh, or we're not surprised to find that the father's response is also loving. When it says that uh, in verse 20, we see the father uh, react in the way he did in an undignified manner. Another thing you might not understand about Jewish culture, and I know many of you have probably heard this, but you would never run, all right? A man, a distinguished man would never run. That, that's just not something you would do. You typically didn't show a lot of affection either in a public square. But it says in verse 20, as he saw him, what did he do? He ran. He ran towards him. And when he embraced him. He didn't wait. Here's what the typical Jewish father probably would have done. Sees him coming over, you know what I do? Stand firm. I'm going to make my son come and bow at my feet grovel, beg. He doesn't. Why? Well, we find out later because he thought that son was dead. He was convinced that son was gone. And when he sees him in an undignified manner, he runs to him in love. He embraces him. He kisses him. And it goes on further. It says that while this son was in his lowest point, and I, and I love what happens here, right? What does the son immediately do? He begins to to say that rehearsed thing that he's already thought about while he was feeding the pigs. He immediately goes in, Father, I've sinned against you. I've sinned against heaven. I just want to be one of your servants. And what is the father's response? Get this boy a robe. Get this boy a ring. Get some, get some sandals on his feet. And what, what is he doing by, by, by showing that? He's signifying 
this, this, this man, this young man, he is still my son. He's still my son. That you, don't, you don't just throw a robe and a ring and sandals on anybody. This is, this is signifying he is, he is mine. And then he says, uh, kill the fatted calf. We're throwing a party. We're throwing a party because the son that, I, that was lost is now found. The son that was dead is alive. And he celebrates because of that repentance. We have people like that within our church, within the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, where they have lived an awful life. They have done some unimaginable things, probably even in their own mind, but especially towards others. And this is the love that we see of our Heavenly Father towards those people, is that He loves them. There, there isn't a, a point of like, He go, my love, no, it doesn't cover that. He, he loves them deeply. And we see here this reaction of, of the Father's love towards these people. By the way, this, this, this younger son, what does he remind you of? Back to verses one and two, right? Man, he's a sinner. He's a tax collector. He has done some things that are just unimaginable. The Pharisees were the ones griping and that Jesus was spending so much time. And here we see the, this story that, that he loves his son, that, that he, he loves that he's alive, and he knows that he, he, there's repentance. Why? Because he's returned back home. And there's celebration, there's joy that comes with this son repenting and coming home. The son was wishing just to be his father's slave, wasn't he? That was, that was his big wish. Can I just go back and be a servant and get fed well? He, that's, that was his, but by coming back home, it was even better. He was accepted as a son once again. And there's a stark contrast in between his story and the older brother's story, which a lot of times I, I feel like we don't put enough emphasis on. We, we, boy, we, oh yeah, celebrate. But here's the reality, and I want you to hear me out on this. Sometimes us in the church look a lot more like the older son than we do the younger and how sad is that of us? I'm going to tell you from my perspective, and just hear me out on this, from my perspective, I'm a church kid. I grew up in the church, didn't get too far off into sin, stayed close to home, never was there a season in my life where I was ever outside the church or outside of teaching for, for any period of time, really, from the time I was a child. And when I read this story, and maybe this is more than what I ought to share. Sometimes I see the reflection of the older son in my attitude through the years. And how tragic that is. How tragic that is that sometimes us, older ones, the ones that have continued, have such a poor perspective on our father's love. And we take our father's love and we box it in thinking it only fits this type of people. And then when we realize it doesn't, rather than celebrating, we become bitter because of that. And so there's a stark contrast here. And so let's walk through this, this contrast. Real f- so we looked at the father's relationship with the younger son. So let's very quickly look at the father's relationship with the older son. And so first off, I want us to notice how the son reacted. He reacted with rage and resentment. When the, when the younger son came home, and he saw what his father did, rather than celebrating, he was full of rage and he was full of resentment. Uh, his anger over, over the way uh, his father acted in receiving the younger brother left him out of the celebration and joy that he could have been experiencing. What did he choose to do when he found out what was going on? It said he refused to go in. He refused it. He saw what was going on. He, a- he asked a servant, hey man, what's going on? He says, hey, listen, your younger brother, remember him? He's back home, and your dad is celebrating. And it says that he's, he refuses to go in. I'm not going in. I'm not, celebrate, I'm not celebrating that. He, he, too, could have been enjoying the fatted calf, by the way, right? He, too, could have been enjoying this celebration. Why? Because he's a son also. He could have been en- enjoying this, the, uh, the fellowship that the father wanted to share with him and everyone else, but his jealousy and his anger robbed him of that opportunity. 
How many times for us that maybe have never gone too wayward that we get robbed out of jealousy and out of anger by watching God work in other people's lives? None of us would ever admit that, but sometimes we do. Maybe it's because they come back and they get more attention. Right? We see this with children, right? Well, what child needs the most attention? The one with the most needs. And typically in a family, what's the child with the most needs? The baby. And what happens to those older kids? They're cool till all of a sudden they don't get the attention that they used to or they feel. And what, what happens? They lash out or they begin to act like babies themselves. Now, if we understand that that happens, why do we think we're beyond that? There are times that jealousy and anger riles up inside of us that honestly has no explanation, but there comes a time that we have to admit those things. Notice how the older son, verses 29 and 30, uh, uh, the older son resent not only his brother, but, but his father. He didn't, just resent, he didn't just resent his brother, right? It's pretty obvious that he resented and he was angry towards his father as well. Clearly also, he had a bad attitude towards his father, an attitude that, that really was no better than the younger son had previously displayed, Right? Did he disrespect his father? Absolutely he did. He refused to go in to something his father was doing. He told his father, you're wrong. I can't believe you would do this. How is his attitude any different than the younger son? It really isn't. We like to gloss that over, but the reality is his attitude's really no different. Notice also that the older son wasn't as obedient as he claimed to be, all right? The older son claimed to be really obedient, but he never really was uh, because he refused to go inside. He refused to go inside. Uh, John Piper writes on this. If you've never read some John Piper stuff, I encourage you to. He, a, great, a great mind uh, at times, but I want to kind of read you uh, an excerpt of things that he, he said about this. Uh, he observes uh, and he says, I quote, there are several clues here that the way that he relates to his father, being the older son, is dishonoring to his father and disuniting to his brother and destructive to himself. How does he see himself and his father relating? Answer, as a master and a slave. Why? Look, for so many years I have been serving you. The word serving, that's what, that, that's what this man uses. And it's the same word that a servant or a slave does. This is not the identity of a son, but of a slave by the language he's using. For many years, I have been serving you. Then he says, I have never neglected one of your commands. How does he see his father? He sees his father as an issuer of commands. He sees his father as a master giving commandments, and he himself as a slave just paying obedience to a master. This is not the way the father wants his children to relate to him. This is a distortion of Christianity. This is not the Christian life, end quote. John Piper is saying this young, this older son is all about commands. And in that, in that an interesting contrast, the, the son has been with the father the entire time, but he's been treating that, that whole relationship like, a, like a, a master and a slave. The older one, I mean the younger one, goes away, and he knows he's ruined it, and he just comes back with that attitude, I just, I, if I can just even be a slave, I'd be happy. And we see this contrast here. Can I ask you, church, how do you look at your relationship with the Lord? Here, here, here's a little tongue-in-cheek comment, and you just take it as, as this is how Trevor usually is, all right? But sometimes, the way I've heard church people describe their relationship with God, it sure sounds like the older brother. Because we fear monger this idea. We talk more about what God would do to you if, you if you disobey rather than his love for us. And listen, what good father ever wants his children to just be afraid of him? Dads that are here, don't answer this out loud, but is that, where you want, is that what you want for your kids? I'm just happy if my kids fear me. I don't really care about love. I just want obedience. No good father says that. Our heavenly father definitely doesn't say that. That's not the, that's not the relationship he wants with us. And so we see here that, that this, 
this older son's rage and resentment shows his true self. He's always treated his relationship with his father as just a bunch of commands and a, guy, and a commander rather than a loving father. But here's the awesome thing. We get to see the reaction of the father to this son, just like we do the younger one. And so let's look at the father's reaction real quick as we close tonight. Verse 28 it says that, that uh, uh, in verse 28, we can clearly see that the parable is, is uh, that that the father reacts in his love towards the uh, older son as well. All right, we've already seen that he reacted in love to his younger one, didn't, he? didn't we? But how does he react to, to the older son who, who is now refused to go inside? The father's response to the older son rage is a loving response. And we're not told what the father might have said at the older son at this point, but we can imagine the reaction he has to the younger son's repentance and what he says later. We can imagine that he was trying to get him to forgive his brother even as he himself had done, and he was glad that his father was all right. It says that he came out, and it, the, the clear there is he entreated him. The older son refuses to go in, and what does, what does the father do? Does he go, forget him, forget him. He, go, he leaves the party. This is the is same imagery as what we see in the first parable. He, he leaves the party and he goes out and he finds his older son. And he goes, man, will you not? We don't know what he says. But you know, you know dads have a way of saying things sometimes that just like cut to the quick of, of, of a son's heart or a child's heart. Especially our, our father, our heavenly father, he has a way of doing things. Aren't, aren't you glad for that? Like no one has to like press on you or like, yell at you. Sometimes literally you can just read scripture and the biggest amount of conviction comes on you that pushes you towards change. You can hear a simple story like this and all of a sudden just be burdened in the way that really no one else could do. And that's what we see here. We see that he loved his son enough to come out and to entreat him, to talk to him, to love on him and say, won't, won't you, what's wrong? Verses 31 and 32, the father's response to the older son's resentment is a loving response as well. Notice that the father reminds the older son uh, that his own standing hasn't changed just because his brother has been received with forgiveness and joy. He reminds him by saying this, you've been here the whole time. You've had access to everything. Nothing's changed. Had, 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 the, had the father and the older son's relationship changed because the son came home? Nope. Had the father's love waned any towards the older son because now the younger son's back home? Nope. And he shows him how much he, he loves him because of that. Notice also the father appeals to his son's professed focus on doing what is right. His son has essentially told him that he's always done what's right, whereas his younger brother hasn't. So his father responds basically by saying this, well, if you always do what's right, then do it now. Come inside. By the way, he wasn't doing what was proper because what was he doing? He was refusing to do what his father asked him to do in that moment. He was refusing to go in and celebrate. How was he really any different than that younger son in that attitude? We'd all like to say, yeah, but he never left. His attitude was poor the whole time. Church, can I, can I tell you something? What good is it if we're here and our attitude stinks the whole time? I had a worker one time, and I've told this to my class, early on in youth ministry, and they'd always want to go every year to Falls Creek, and they'd talk about how much they love students. You know what's funny about that, though? They complained the entire time they were around students. Enough that after a few years, I finally just take them to the side. You know, and I'm young, all right? So first off, I'm not always for certain how to word things at that age. And I know how, how my face already looks, all right? I already look mad, so I gotta be careful how I word things. But I take, take this person aside and I go, do you really wanna go? Absolutely, I want to. You know, you know I love going to Falls Creek. And sir, then why do you act like you hate the kids while you're there? All you do is complain about them the whole time. I'd rather take somebody that isn't as big of a help, which, by the way, they were huge help. But they were just constantly complaining. They were constantly complaining, and, and this is kind of what we see sometimes in the church. We do it, but we do it more out of resentment or duty than what we actually love the Father. 
Church, can I ask you something real quick before we end tonight? Are you resenting some things towards our Father? Are you doing things with the right attitude? Do we think that we're better just because we're doing it? I would say no. If our attitude stinks, how are we any better than the people that have just walked away? You're like, well, at least we're doing something. I don't know. I don't know if that's the right answer to that. I would actually say it's probably not. Because if our heart's not in the right place, God told the Israelites time and time again, you come and you make sacrifices, but your heart is far from me. Was he happy with that? I don't think so. From what I can tell, God never spoke favorably of those things. So we got to check our attitude. Maybe you're one of the older ones. You're one of those that never walked away. First off, thank you for never doing that. Thank you for staying faithful. But let's fix our attitude in the midst of it. Notice finally at the end of the parable, it kind of seems to be missing. You notice what we, what we never get told at the end of the parable? We never get to find out what the older son did. You ever, you ever find that interesting? Literally, it doesn't tell us what he does. It just ends. And then it goes on to a parable about a dishonorable, man, a dishonorable manager. I, I think Jesus obviously was doing this on purpose. Why? Because a verdict was still out on those scribes and Pharisees. They still had time to fix their attitude. To fix their attitude about the sinners and the tax collectors and to come alongside and, and rejoice at what, the, what God was doing. And for us, I think, I think that's where it is. For us, here would be my call to you tonight. First off, if you're here, it's a Sunday night. I assume you're one of those that are just faithful because you feel like you should be. Thank you. First thing I want you to do is check your attitude in that faithfulness. Do you do it out of love for the Father? Or you do it out of duty. If it's the second one, what needs to change to do it out of love? To do it out of, to celebrate what God's doing. To stay faithful in his ministry because of how much you love him and how much you know he loves you. Not just to do it because, well, somebody's got to do it. Man, God doesn't want that attitude. God wants something bigger than that. And so maybe for us, if you're one of those, yeah, check, let's check our attitude. Let's make sure certain, certain it's right. Let's not be resentful towards other things going on or while other people celebrate. One of the things I'll tell you real quick, things that I've resented in my life, and maybe not inside the church, but outside church, when I see other ministries do well. And it doesn't seem like we're doing as well where I'm at. You want to you gut punch real quick? See how resentful you are in those moments. Okay, and I'm not talking about people teaching wrong things. I'm talking about solid other churches teaching the same thing we are, and all of a sudden they have success, and all of a sudden we get resentful about that. I mean, that's something that has happened in my own life. Youth, youth ministries that seem to thrive all of a sudden, I don't understand why, and rather than celebrating, you know what I do? I've, I've felt resentful in my immaturity. Man, what kind of attitude is that? That is horrible. God wants me to celebrate along with them, especially when they're preaching the gospel and they're being solid in those things. And so maybe tonight we need to check our attitude. Number two is not just towards the Lord. Why do we do things? But towards other people. And to me, this is a big one. This is a big one. Hear me out on this. The church should look diverse. And diverse meaning different backgrounds of different people, all saved by the same Father all welcomed in by the same love, the same gospel. And for you and I, maybe that's where we're at. Man, we do things out of love, but we can't understand why God would save people like that. And that's the attitude that needs to be changed. May we not be scribes and Pharisees. May we not look at others and go, why are you spending time with them? Let's be more like Christ. Let's go find those people. Let's stop trying to figure out who is open to the gospel, and just preach it. I'm going to tell you right now, I have no clue. In 20 years, the people who have become strong surprise me still, and the people that I thought were going to be strong disappoint me still. That's how it works. But the reality is, God is the one that saves. God is the one who sustains. God is the one who sanctifies. And I just need to be obedient to him in love and just reach out 
And God's going to do his perfect work with those people if I'm willing to come alongside him and serve. And so I encourage you tonight. Maybe this is a little bit different perspective, but I do know this. There are times that God wants to change our attitude or maybe just remind us of what we already know. However God spoke to you tonight, I hope you'll respond in the way that he desires and in, what, in a way not just that affects tonight, but affects next week, affects the next three months, and affects maybe hopefully the rest of our life as we serve God out of a heart of love and also alongside of one another. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to get to come, to get to open your word. And Father, I pray tonight that as we just have a few moments of response, that Father, if we need to come forward, we need to pray in the altar, we need to, to, to let people know of a decision we made, we'll do that. But Father, ultimately, that we'll leave this place with a different attitude, a different motivation, a different motive than the one that we came in. Father, for the ones that need to be encouraged tonight, I pray that they've been encouraged through your word. For the ones that need to be convicted, I pray that they'll be, they've been convicted by your word tonight. May you work in this time of invitation. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.